It is so good to be back at Discovery Church. I have been off for about four weeks now um, on sabbatical. It's been amazing. I look darker. I look darker. I look a little grayer. <laughs> what so seven years of ministry will do. No, I'm just kidding. We, we, started, we started Discovery Church seven years ago, about seven and a half years ago. And this is kind of like our sabbatical year. And we honor God with, like, it's not a religious thing for us, not like a legalistic thing, but, but we do. We take a Sabbath rest, my family and I. And I encourage our church, our church family, those who follow Jesus to like have a pause, have a break, a day in your week, that one day where you just pause, reflect, remember, rejoice in God and cease from your work and know that God is good. Can I get an amen, somebody? So in our seventh year, we got a lot from our pastors and mentors. They said, hey, it would be great to take a sabbatical and give God some time and space in your life to, to see what he would do, what is new that he would do. And Gosh, it's been amazing. We got away from a lot of things and decluttered, and, and God has really spoken to us. And we are going to celebrate our eight-year anniversary in September. It's about a month and a half away, something like that, a uh, month and a half away. But the number eight has a lot of significance in the Bible. The number eight is the, is the number, the meaning is of new beginnings. And I think God is about to do something new here at Discovery Church. Can I get an amen? Come on. Someone say, you ain't seen nothing yet. I believe so, man. I'm excited about today launching a brand new series with you that we're going to study the book of James. We're going to go through this entire book together. And if you've been around here at Discovery for, I don't know, years, months, whatever, I usually teach topically. I'll take an idea, a thought, a principle, and I'll teach the scriptures and the kingdom principles around that topic. And the, the reason why, by the way, I teach that way is because that was the model of Jesus. And he, the Bible says he taught as one who had authority. He didn't teach like the scribes and Pharisees. So I try to model my teaching off of the master teacher himself. But I think it is very good for us to dig into sections portions, and even books. And I'm excited to study this one because a lot of people, they, so they've equated James to the Proverbs of the New Testaments because, because there's so much wisdom, like practical everyday wisdom from building your faith or finances or eternity or how to deal with like favoritism in your relationships and how to let works be a part of your life, but still have like walking by, by grace. It's just an amazing book. He talks about being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. James makes the argument that true spirituality is determined by how one lives, not by what one knows. Amen. And I tend to agree with James. So we're going to take Probably, I'm thinking as I dissected it, about nine weeks. This is going to be, we're just going to, I don't know how long, I think about nine weeks is going to take us to get, get through this. And so I told one of my pastors that they're all nine weeks, it's only five chapters. I'm like, dude, I could preach two verses for like a, a series by itself, okay? So, so again, topically, I take one and I just kind of dissect it. And so we're going to go through and study the book of James together. So if, if you don't have a Bible, now would be a great time to go buy a Bible or something, okay? Life application Bible would be great. That's the one I recommend. Bring that thing. Take some notes because you're going to learn a lot. You're going to grow a lot. Now, what is the, the book of James? Who is this James? Because we see James in the New Testament. The name, his name, James, shows up, but it's not the one you're, some of you may be thinking of. It's not the disciple, the apostle James. This James is actually the brother of Jesus. Now, now, or in more appropriately, the half-brother of Jesus. A lot of you know that, okay, Jesus was the son of, of Mary, but Joseph was not his father. It was like, like the Holy Spirit was. God was his father. She had not known Joseph in that way yet. But after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary did get married, and they had more kids. And his siblings are even mentioned in the scriptures. And James here is one of those siblings. The interesting thing about James, though, is that he did not believe in Jesus when Jesus was on earth. He did not believe in Jesus when he was preaching and teaching miracles and signs and wonders and all those things. We don't see anything about him following Jesus. It was only until after his death and resurrection that, that James actually gave his heart to Jesus, which is an interesting even phrase, giving your heart. Like if you think of it like that, what would it take? This would, if there's anything that proves the divinity of Jesus, it might be this right here, that, that Jesus convinced James, his brother, that he was God. 
How many of you could convince your sibling that you're God? How many here? How many here? Okay. <laughs> right? How many here would give your heart to your sibling? No, man, like, I'm serious. Like, if there's anything that proves the divinity of Jesus, it's probably this. Jesus, Jesus' brother surrendered the control of his life and said, this dude's God, this God right here, okay? I'm just saying, that's, that's a powerful testimony. So he writes this very practical letter, and much different from all the others, James has a very different focus, personality. You can see it right off the bat. He just jumps right in, and we're going to cover in James chapter 1 today, we're going to talk about overcoming trials and temptations. Now, these, these two things are very, they're interrelated. I'm going to tell you why in a moment. But James just jumps right in. If you go read Paul's letters, a lot of Paul's letters in, letters in the New Testament, he starts off with pleasantries. And, and I pray that your, your eyes your, you would be enlightened to see the goodness of God and that you would have the power to, and all this stuff. And James is like, he just is different here. here um, ha, trials are a part of our life. They're inevitable, though. And this is why. Trials and temptation are part of every single one of our lives. Like for, if you were honest, if you're honest here, like how many would say today you are in a trial of some kind? How many would you say that? Raise your hand. If you're in a trial of some kind, yes, yeah, like half of this room is in a trial. How many of you, the trial is sitting next to you? No, I'm just kidding. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, you done made it worse. I was kidding. I was kidding. You messed that up. Woo. It's a different trial now. It's a different trial. You know, I'll send you to a counselor. James chapter 1. Let's just jump right into it. James chapter 1. Check it out. Grab your notes, you guys. We're going to study this thing. If you don't have notes, we give them away. If you don't have sermon note binders, go grab one from the Information Center, Connection Center. Keep those notes because we're going to dig into this thing. James chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. James, he says, a servant of God, which is awesome, isn't it? He's not, I'm the brother of Jesus. He's like, no, no, no. I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, they scattered from Jerusalem because of persecution at this time. Greetings. And that's all he says. And he says, let's get into it now. Okay. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. There is no pleasantries. He's just like, hey, greetings. By the way, if you're under trials, be happy. <laughs> Suck it up. You know what I mean? It's like, wait, James, do you know what I'm going through here? And then uh, th this is like 99% of us argue with this verse. Like, like it, it's really hard to consider it pure joy when we're going through trials. Trials, here's my definition, like not in your handout or anything, but my definition of trials. Trials are the inevitable circumstances that make life hard. That's what trials are. They're just things that happen through life. But listen to me, they have the potential to teach you things. They have the potential to grow you, to mature you. We're going to find out today and in this series that God is not a tempter. He does not tempt you. But listen, he will allow you to be tested. He will allow you to go through trials and testing so that it can grow you, test your faith, and develop you. And before you think too badly about God here, you do the same thing, right? Especially if you're a parent here today. If you're a parent here, you do the same thing. Like when your kids go back to school here, thank you, Jesus, in about a month. <laughs> kids are going back to school. They're going to be excited for, I don't know, a couple of weeks, but just give it some time. And you're going to hear it one morning. What are you going to hear, parents? You know, I don't want to go to school. <laughs> I don't want to go. To, can I stay home today? No, you can't stay home today. You can get out of that bed, brush your teeth, and make your bed, by the way. By the way, take out the trash before you go. I intentionally, as a dad, I intentionally inflict pain and misery on my kids. Get to school, kid. I know it's misery. I know it sucks. I know it's painful to get up that early and do your chores and brush your teeth and all that stuff. But I do it intentionally in the hope that they will grow and pay their own bills one day. Can I get an amen, parents? Come on, somebody. I allow tests. I allow them to be tested. In fact, you can't go to school without tests because tests do something. Tests show something. Tests reveal whether you need to redo the material or you can go to the next grade. Okay, God wants you to grow up, to move on, to go to the next grade, and God is more interested in your character than your comfort. So God will allow you, he will call you out of your comfort, not your capacity. 
In fact, the only way that God can increase your capacity is to increase your discomfort. Ooh, oh my goodness, Pastor Jason. You back, you back, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> Look, some of you want God. You want, you, want, you want more of God to increase your capacity. This is how he does it. God wants, the only way to increase your capacity is to increase your discomfort. That's the way. He, it's through the testing of our faith, through the trials that we endure. Proverbs chapter 17, verse three says this, the crucible for silver, the burning furnace for gold. This is what happened. They would, they would test and purify it. They would turn up the heat on the metal and the in, it would prove the authenticity of the metal. It would purify. Okay, what is not pure? What is not authentic in the metal would rise to the top and they would skim off the top. And he says, look, look, this is how the Lord tests your heart. So the heat is turned up. You know what happens when the heat is turned up and we're in a trial? Trials often expose the authenticity of our confidence in God. They expose it. Things rise to the surface that we didn't know was there. And we thought we were stronger. You thought you knew more. You knew, you knew better. But the trial came. And something rises to the top right there. It proves, it, 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 it proves the authenticity of the confidence that we have in God. How does that happen? Let's go verse by verse. Let's study this thing. Number one, the first thing James wants us to know is to recognize What's really going on? What is really going on? And one of the tragedies of tests and trials is that those, the pain and the problem hijacks the learning lesson. Like we're so focused on the problem that we can't see what God is trying to teach us that it's almost like you have to get over the pain. You have to get over the distress. You have to get over the discomfort to actually see what God is trying to teach you in the middle of it because tucked under the financial despair that you're going through right now, tucked under your marriage problems, tucked under the mistakes you've even made, under that is a, is, is a learning opportunity that God wants to show you. Is, is development, a lesson to be learned in the middle of it. Verse two, again, James one, he says, consider it. Hey, I need you to think differently about this. Like, like consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's kind of messed up, James. How in the world am I supposed to do that? Key phrase in this sentence that you ought to write down. Because you know. Because you you know your attitude is determined by your understanding. You, you will only rejoice based upon the facts that you know. Some of you don't know what God is doing in the middle of it. Therefore, you cannot rejoice. You cry. Because you know, well, what do we know? That the testing of your faith, all tests, all trials you're going through is trying to produce this one thing inside of you. Perseverance. Patient endurance, one, some of your translations say patient endurance or perseverance, the ability to go through that thing and not react like I always react and not blow up and not fly off the handle, man. God will allow stuff to test us and some of us are running from the very school of character that God is giving us as a blessing, as a gift. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to live on a budget, God. I want it now. I want it now, God. I don't want to get along with my sister, Dad. I don't want to get along with him, my husband. I don't want to get along with my husband. He's mean. Family is one of the best tests. It's one of the best schools of character, man, without... Because if you can get along without kicking and yelling and screaming, boy, man, it's a... God is testing us. The character, what if God allowed the trial to free you from what's holding you captive? What if God allowed that thing, that there was development? We always pray for the trial to be removed, but here's what James says. Number two, you got to start cooperating with this thing if you want to grow up. You got to start, if you want to mature up and grow up, cooperate with God's growth process because he's going to do it whether you like it or not because he's a good God. He's a good father, so it's going to happen, okay? He's going to get you out of bed. You're going to have to go to school. But just because my mom made me go to school doesn't mean I learned anything. I got to cooperate with the process, don't I? Yeah, yeah, I didn't learn anything until I went to college. No, I'm kidding. But I mean, 
because I didn't cooperate with the process, okay? James 1 and 4 says, perseverance must finish. Hey, don't quit on that thing, man. Don't pray it away. Don't give up. Don't blow it up. I wish you would just let God do what he wants to do in the middle of your testing, in the middle of your trial. I wish you would just let it finish the work that God wants to do inside of you so that you can be, he says, mature and complete, not lacking anything. What if there was something on the other side of that trial that was worth going through the pain? What if there was something in there worth it? Like, God, I want, I want more of you. I want everything you have for me. Some of you pray that and you think, like, God, I want everything you have for me. Really? Really? Is that why you're getting a C in finances and a D in friendship in the school of life? Listen to me. Some of your trials are the very answer to your own prayers. You thought God was going to presto change o you. <laughs> but what he really wanted to do was let that trial produce character, to produce maturation, to turn you into the man, the woman that he's called you to be. But too many people, they want the appearance of character. They want the appearance of winning rather than the practice and hard work that creates a true champion. Come on, somebody say amen. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 says this, not only so, we also, there's that word again, rejoice. Like, are these people crazy? What do they know that I don't know? Well, they know. Rejoice in our sufferings because here it is again. We know that our suffering, it's that same thing again. Here it is. It produces what God is trying to produce, some, some patient endurance, some, some perseverance. And perseverance is what's going to perfect your character. And character is going to give you hope to hold on. Hold on. Hold on, because I know. Somebody say, I know now. I know now. I know now. I know now. You got to consider it pure joy. I know now that my problems aren't supposed to defeat me. They're supposed to develop me. I know now. Somebody say, I know now. Consider it pure joy. See, when I consider my trials, I don't think defeat. I think development. I know now. When I consider my trials, I don't think failure, I think future, I know now. Come on, somebody say, I know now. You got to know this or else you're not going to endure the test and you'll repeat the grade. You'll go through it again, I promise you. You'll go through it again if you don't know. Here's, if you're going to make it through the trial, you got to do number three, ask for God's help. Number three, ask for God's help. And that might seem like, okay, move on to the next point, James. I get that one. But it still boggles my mind how long it takes people to actually ask. Like we will do everything first before we go to God in the middle of our trials. James says, I got a little tip for you. You're going through a trial? Talk to God. <laughs> About what? He even tells you how to ask in verse 5. James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, which by the way, wisdom is the application of what you no. Someone say, I know. I know. Okay, okay. Oh, you know now. Oh, you know why you're going through. You know that God is like, like, you know that now. Okay, you know that God is producing something in the middle of the trial, but how, how do you apply what you know? Now I'm in the trial. I know like you're supposed to be producing something, but, but this sucks, okay? I don't even see it. I don't get it. This is, this is now, follow the thought. This is where James is going. Okay, you know, but if you lack the wisdom to apply what you know, here's what you should do. Talk to God. <laughs> Ask God about it. And he's going to give you the wisdom generously without even finding fault, he says. So, which means, here's the prayer you ought to pray. You don't pray, <laughs> God, get me out of this mess. That's not the prayer to pray. No, 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 you know, you know better than that now. You know better than that now. You're not going to pray that anymore when you're tested and you're in trial. You're not going to try to escape from the school of character and development that God has you in. You're not going to pray that way because you know, but you still need the wisdom to apply what you know. So here's the prayer. Here it is. God, what are you teaching me in this? It's not God get me out of this. It's God, what are you teaching me in this? You need wisdom. See, just because you go through suffering and trials doesn't mean that you became any better. Some of you know that God wants to use it. You just don't know how he wants to use it. You lack the wisdom to apply what you know. So James says, hey, you're going to go through it anyway. You might as well ask for wisdom. Amen. Come on, are you receiving this, somebody? Amen. You might as well just ask for some wisdom. What, am I, what should I be learning right now, God, 
then let, let God give you the wisdom, which means this. Listen, you can actually speed up the, the test, the length of time it takes for you to pass that test. You can actually speed it up by asking this question. Some of you are going through the test even longer and longer and longer. You're enduring trials and testing because you haven't learned this yet. You haven't learned what God was trying to teach you through it to develop the perseverance character inside of you, to develop your faith. Some of you are overwhelmed by your trials. You're overwhelmed. We become overwhelmed when we don't understand God's ways. So, so you know, I know that God is trying to produce something inside of me, but I'm overwhelmed because I don't know his ways in this. So I got to ask, what are you trying to produce, God? What am I supposed to be learning? What are you teaching me inside of this? And when I understand his ways and what I'm actually enduring for, for the price set before me, I can endure this pain. I can endure it now. I, can't, I don't need to be overwhelmed because I, I see, ask God for help. And then if you want to overcome your trials, number four, James tells us, hey, you got to keep a good attitude. You got to keep a good attitude. Verse six and seven, he says, when he asks, he must believe. And believe is a good, like another good word, a synonym for believe is attitude. If you're going through a trial, you're like, man, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Or if you say, you know, this is tough, but I'm going to trust you anyway, God. That's attitude. That's attitude. He says, if anyone believes and not, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded. The word there means literally two minds or two souls. Like, I know, but I still don't get it. And that's where some of you get caught up in this double mind. And that's why we feel so unstable and rocked. We go in and out of church and faith and good and bad because you're, you're not taking that thing captive. You're allowing yourself to have two minds, two thoughts about it. No, no, no. You have one thought. I know. I know, God. No, no, no. I'm not going to entertain that one. No, I know, God. I know you're doing something inside of me. You're doing something inside of me. What is it? Show me, God. Show me. I'm not going to allow this thing to create instability in everything I do. See, problems don't automatically produce blessing. Your attitude makes the difference. It's not automatic. Watch what happens when we do have the right attitude. In verse 12, James says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he stood that test, you didn't run from it. You didn't flake out of it. You didn't get angry and blow up out of it. Like you got wisdom in the middle of it. When you stood that test, he'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those that love him. And then right after talking about trials, he goes, like at the next breath, he goes, and by the way, let me talk to you about temptation because they're quite different. Temptations are not from God. Here, here's an extra little side note for you. Trials are God's method to grow you. Temptation is Satan's strategy to destroy you. There's, there's, there's the difference. The, the, and these two concepts are tightly related because trials in our lives will always lead us to temptation. See, whenever you're undergoing a trial or a testing season, that's when you are most tempted to give in to that sin, to, give, to quit, to give up, to run, to divorce, to, to, when, it, when you're going through, think about it. Think about when you messed up, when you fell for that temptation. Think about the last time you fell for it. It was most likely in a stage, a season, a time, a period where you were undergoing trial, where you're being tested. The heat was turned up. And see, the temptation is a way of, it's an opportunity to escape the trial. That's what the temptation is. So when we take that bait, it's, it's, it's escaping the trial. But oftentimes what we escape to is what we become enslaved by. So let me define it this way. Here's, here's the definition of temptation. I already give you trials. Here's temptation. Temptations are opportunities to choose something other than God. A temptation is rooted in the lie, listen, that something other than God and his will can meet my needs or bring me satisfaction. It's a lie. Something other than God and his will can actually meet my needs and bring me satisfaction. And this is the enemy's job. The enemy's job is to lure you, to, to, to bait you in, to lure you away. The best illustration of temptation is like in a fishing pond. He casts that, that bait out there and he just kind of, 
you know, puts it in front of your face. Come on now, you want this? You ever see that dollar commercial, that insurance? Oh, almost got it. Oh. That's what he's doing. He's baiting you in. The devil wants you to, he wants to make sure you have the opportunity to do something you know you shouldn't do. But he makes it look so good. He makes it look so promising to lure you away. All temptation has one goal, to get you away from God, to mess that relationship up. So here's the first thing James says about temptations. Now, number one, he says, you got to recognize the source of temptations. Hey, you're undergoing trial and stuff. You're, when you're persecuting, you got to be careful because it's easy to, to get sucked into the bait, to the lure, but you got to recognize the source of your temptation. Let's be clear. The devil didn't make you do it. The devil didn't make you do it. He just gave you the opportunity to do it. You didn't have to bite the bait. <laughs> it was his job to make it look good. It was your job to resist the devil and he will flee, draw near to God. That's what our job is. His job is, and that's all throughout scripture, you guys, all throughout. The, the blame, James says, is, is the way of escape. Some of you guys have asked the question before, God, what did I do to deserve this? God, how come you allowed this? It's a way of escape. You need to go back to what you know, right? God didn't do that. The enemy provided the opportunity. Here's what James says in verse 13. He goes, he switches right to temptation now and says, okay, here's the trial. You're going to be tempted, but when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God is not the source of your temptation. And by the way, he says, when tempted, not if tempted. Every one of us has to deal with temptation. We're all going to experience temptation. And what we need to do, James says, number two, what we need to do is understand the process of temptation. James, he, he helps us out here. Temptation is a process, not an isolated incident. Y'all know that, right? It's, not an, it's a process. It's not a one like, oh, I just felt, no, you didn't. You were following that bait for it, it's not an isolated incident. It's a process. James says if you just knew how it happens, you'd be better off. So in two verses, James gives us the five stages of temptation. The five stages. And I'm going to read the verse to you, and then I'll give you the five stages. Verse 14 and 15. And I, if you want to highlight them or underline them, I did it all highlight. I know. I know. Just do. Highlight all these. Okay. But, and then I'll break it down. But each one, say each one. Hey, none of you are above it, okay? Every single one of you, if you think you are standing firm, be careful, you're about to fall, is what the scripture says. Each one is tempted when? By his own evil desire. Oh, the devil didn't make me do it. By his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. I want you to write these five stages down. I'm gonna give them to you because I wanna expose the devil's plan, okay? The, the Bible says don't, don't be unaware of the, the devil's schemes. Okay, we need to be aware of his schemes, of his plans, of his strategies, and James is trying to help us out here. So here's the five stages of temptation you need to be aware of. Here's the first one is just the, the temptation. So there it is, whoop, put in the water, the bait. There's the lure, there's the bait. Each one is tempted. You cannot get away from this one. And listen to me, you should not associate how much you are being tempted with how mature you are. That's not, those, there's no correlation really there. Just because you're tempted does not mean that you're that far from God. Jesus himself was tempted, yet he was without sin. Hebrews chapter four tells us that when he was, he was tempted on all counts, temptation itself is not bad. The very fact that you're being tempted is probably a good sign, because if you're not butting heads with the devil every now and then, you must be walking with him. So... And before, some of you were thinking like, well, I don't know if I'm, if I'm, if I'm really tempted. Because when we think of temptation, obviously, sometimes we go like sexual sin and, and drugs and all this stuff. That's what, you're, that's what most time, at least in church, and we think about temptation, that's where you go with. Let me kind of widen your scope of the enemy's schemes of what he's trying to do to get you to buy into something that is not God or his will to produce something inside of you. Look, the root of all temptation is validation and fulfillment. So here's, here's the lie. Something other than God can actually validate me, can make me feel like I have value, I have worth, I have meaning, I'm significant, can give me fulfillment, can give me satisfaction. The enemy wants to say, no, 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 over here, look, it's better over here. Look, this way's easier. Shortcut, here you go. 
You don't have to pay taxes. Here, you can actually do this and this. Hey, here's what you can do. Here's, it's easier, it's better, it's shorter, it's more, it's, it's, it's whatever it is. It's whatever for your validation, for your value, for your worth, or for your satisfaction, your pleasure, your fulfillment. It doesn't have to be just what you're thinking of. Every one of us are tempted just differently. Where do you go to to get your validation? Where do you go to get validated? Where do you go to get fulfillment? Where do you go to get satisfaction? And is it other than God and his will? I'm trying to expose the lie of the enemy because this is how all, Christ, all spiritual development and growth comes through this, by exposing the lie of the devil, exposing the lie of the enemy to the truth of God's word, and then making a decision. Who are you going to believe, Amen. Satan or God? Amen. Who, who are you going to believe? Are you, are you going to continue to go that way for your validation and satisfaction and fulfillment? Or are you going to do it God's way? Are you going to go after God? So that's the first step, temptation. You can't get away from it. We can't. The second stage of temptation that James gives us is where we start to entertain it a little bit. I call it fantasy. We start to fantasize. We start to consider what would it be like if? What would it be like if I, if I drank it? If I smoked it? If I slept with it? If I, if I, if I did it? If I, if, if whatever it is, what would it be like? Like whatever that is, what would it be like? And here's what we do. We rationalize it. Oh, I think my life would be better. I think it would be better. I think it would be easier. I think actually it would work that way. And if you could write it down next to that fantasy, write down this word, eyes. Eyes, you have to control. It's your eyes, it's what you're looking at that produces what you're thinking, considering, contemplating. Like I'm thankful for the internet. I'm grateful for it. But it's also a tool of the enemy as well. Okay, I, and I, because... In our sabbatical, we actually put away our phones for four weeks, got off social media. Like, no phone. We actually got a landline. You know what I mean? How many know what a landline was? Like, landline. Landline. I don't know. So we got one of those things, and, and we got away from social media. And oh my, like some of you, because some of you are like, well, I didn't do anything. Yeah, but it's right there luring you. It's right there, like, moving you, like, luring you away with your eyes. Not your notes. Check this out. Jesus said it's all about your eyes. If you control your eyes, you win the game. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body. Jesus has given us the secret. The eye is actually what is going to light you up, man. If your eye is good, it's healthy, your whole body is going to be good and healthy. Hey, protect your eyes. That's how you do it, your eyes. Jesus is giving you the secret. It's your eyes. Protect your eyes because if your eyes are bad, your whole, body, your whole self is going, to be, is going to be bad. But if your eye, the light, go on, go on. But if the, if, the, if the light within you is darkness, he says, how dark is that going to be? Protect your eyes. If you control your focus, God will fight your battles. Which is why it's imperative for you to have your filters on your internet, for you to get accountability, for you to do whatever you need to do to protect your eyes. Because if you don't stop it here, if you don't stop it at the fantasizing where in your mind you start to entertain it, you cannot stop temptation. It's going to happen. All of us are going to have that happen. But, but this is where you need to stop the fantasizing, the considering, the thinking about it. If you don't stop it there, it will go, James says, to this next stage, this next stage. Number three, you start moving toward sin. So you haven't really committed the sin yet. Not, not really. You haven't like, but you started moving. He used the word dragged away and enticed. These two words in the Greek are actually hunting terms. Dragged away is, is snared in a trap. It's where you, get, you catch an animal in, in, in a trap. And enticed is actually a fishing term. It means lured with a bait. Lured with a bait. Yeah. How many of you try to catch a fish with a bear hook? No, no, no. He knows the specific bait you like. Where you need validation, where you need satisfaction, where you need your fulfillment. He knows what to use with you. All right. What, what, he knows your weakness and he hides the hook. This isn't where you've sinned necessarily, but you've taken some steps. You've started to like move towards it a little bit. Maybe make some room for it. And as your pastor, I love you so much. Listen, I want to give you some advice. If that's Because some of you are here today, and this is where you're at. You've, you've been tempted. You've been considering and fantasizing. It would be. It would be so good. No one will know. Oh, I could just. I could just. And yeah. And now you start to move towards it a little bit. You are literally, listen to me, you are just one bite away from like the hook being set in. Just one bite. Some of you, listen to me. I got some. Because I love you. Can I give you this advice? Run. 
Run. Run. The Bible says flee immorality. Like run away from that thing. Let me give you some, some an additional advice. Don't just run away. Run, run toward your destiny. Run toward what God has for you. Don't walk. Don't stroll. Don't meander. Don't wander. Run toward God. Stop positioning. I'm telling you, some of you are so close. You've been moving towards it. And if you keep going, the fourth stage, James tells us, is the actual act of sin. So I bit it. I took it. Because what you flirt with, you will fall for. But be careful here, because Satan, listen, Satan's main, main job is not temptation, it's accusation. That's his main job. So, so some of you have actually, I'm not here to, con, like, to condemn you of your sin. I, I'm here to show you a way out of it, okay? I'm here to expose the plan of the enemy. Here's what the Proverbs say. Proverbs says that a righteous man will fall seven times and rise again. See, in Christ Jesus, you will never run out of second chances. Look, in the God that you, the God that we serve is not a God that, that when you come in and you've done tucking the hook and it's lured you away and you've, you've kind of done it, did it, smoked it, slapped with it, whatever it is, you've made the mistake already, say, oh, I've already done it. It's too far for me. The God that we serve doesn't go, oh my God, who are, can you go fix that before you get in here? Like, get out of my presence. Good. It is, that's not, that's not your God. Your God is one, like Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses, that he sympathizes with our sins, that he looks at that and he goes, he goes, hey, dad, I know what that's like. That's hard right there. Hey, we need to give him some help. We need to give some grace. The Bible says we approach the throne of grace so that we may find mercy to help us in our time of need. So if you're here today and you've got the hook set in, look, God's not mad at you. He loves you. And he wants to give you grace to get out of it. But you need to approach the throne. Just look, just, just approach the throne. Just start going that way and go this way. That's all. That's all it is. Because if you, if you don't turn from this thing, if you don't get the hook out of your mouth and stop letting the devil run your life, man, and that sin run your life, if you don't, James gives us the final stage, which is death. Death. That's the result. The result of sin. You cannot sin and get away with it. Did you hear me? You're, you are free to choose. You can choose, but you can't choose the consequence. Some of the consequences are, are dependent on, 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 on the hook. Some, some is like actual physical death. Some sin like you die. You will die if you try to. But, but many of us are, are, are experiencing relational death because of, our, because of the hook, because of the bait. Emotional death, financial death, spiritual death. That's the, that was the plan of the enemy all along. But by persevering through the trial, we experience life. By yielding to temptation, we experience death. See, Proverbs tells us about this. Proverbs 14 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but eventually, it looks right, it looks good, it looks faster, it looks easier, looks like no one's going to know. It's a, it looks right, but eventually, if you don't take the hook out of your mouth, your marriage is gone. Your soul is gone. Your conscience is seared. Your, your, your spirit is, it, it, it will end in this place. I always say we need to magnify the consequences of sin, not the, not the pleasures of sin. Some of you magnifying the, the, the pleasures like, ooh, it'll be so good, it'll be better, it'll be that. No, 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 magnify the consequences. I had a mentor, one of, one of my pastors years ago, gave me his list and told me these are the things I think about to magnify the consequences. And I've done that and rehearsed this list in my mind. And so, so some, of the, some of the things I do to magnify the consequences of sin is, is I think about what it would do to my wife. What, what was it going to do to my marriage? What, I think about you. I think, well, what the shame that, that if I fell into temptation, that I, that I let every one of you down, every one of you down. I, would, I think about the, the, the shame, I would, the reproach of the gospel on Jesus that I would. And, and, and although, the, oh, man, that thing was looking really good a moment ago, but when I compared it to the list, ugh, that is, there's no comparison. I don't want to take the bait because of the consequences outweigh the pleasure. The consequences out, outweigh it all. So number three, James continues, and I got to hurry. Number three, learn how to overcome temptation. I wish I could take a whole sermon just right here, a whole hour. Learn how to overcome it, verse 16 and 17. He says, don't be deceived. So this is not another 
like another thought. He's going on the same thought of temptation, the same thought. Don't be deceived about temptation, where it comes from, how you get deceived, how, you, how it produces death. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So he's like, that almost looks like a different thought, but no, he's teaching us something. Here, write it down your side notes. I'm giving you a lot of side notes. I know. I haven't preached in two weeks. Leave me alone. Here it is. It's the principle of replacement. The principle of replacement. It's, it's, it's not, you don't try to not think about it. What you do is you replace the thought. So when I'm tempted, hey, don't be deceived. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. Here's what you need to think about. God's got some great things for you. That's what you think about. Don't fight temptation. Turn your attention. Turn it. Shift your thoughts. Change your mental channel. Replace evil with good because the more you fight a feeling, the more that feeling controls you. You, do, you don't fight the temptation. You ignore it. The more you ignore it, you weaken it. The more you fight it, the more it controls you. Think about it. I mean, I have a problem with sweets right now. I go through my battles up and down, up and down. I've been on sabbatical. I've been eating every sweet thing. You don't, you, I don't not eat sweets by going, I'm not going to eat sweets today. I'm not going to eat sweets today. I'm not going to eat sweets today. All I'm doing is thinking about sweets. I'll be at sweet surrender by the afternoon. Sweet, 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 sweet surrender. It is, okay. No, you replace that thought. That's what you do. You know, you, you think about working out or going for a walk or let me eat something healthy and let me, let me actually feel good. Let me get some clear skin again and let me, or whatever it is, let me trim down my, get back into my good pants, okay? Whatever it is, you replace, replace the, the thoughts, okay? Good news. I got good news for you in this, you guys. God obligates himself to help you out of that mess in two ways. He says, I will never allow you to be tempted more than you can handle and I'll always give you a way of escape. Always. First Corinthians 10, 13, he says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. You ain't different from anybody else. We all endure it. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he says, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. That's a promise. Amen, somebody? Here are some thoughts to help you overcome it. I'm going to be quick. These aren't in your notes. Avoid harmful influences. Avoid harmful influences. Like make good decisions about your music. Make good decisions about your movies. Um, I'm just saying it's a whole lot easier to quit drinking if you don't go to the bar. Okay? <laughs> Profound, huh? You know what I mean? Just make some. Avoid harmful influences, you guys. All right, number two. Counter with the word. Jesus modeled this with us, right? When he was tempted, led into the wilderness. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Online, I'm going to teach about that. I'll post something. Follow Discovery. Follow me. I'm going to post something about that. Counter the word. Counter the word. Counter with the word. Temptation. Every time. Know your word. Study your word. Memorize your word. Go back to the school of your Bible. Come to church like it's not a checklist, but part of your discipleship. Can I get an amen, somebody? And then, and then develop healthy friendships. This is God's system. God's system. It's why we have small groups here at Discovery. The goal is that you would not just go through studies and stuff like that, which is great, but the goal is to get some people in your life that know you and know your secrets. That's the goal, that you have some people in your life that know you and know your secrets. Now, we all have secrets. It's just the question is, who knows them other than you? And are those people leading you towards God's things or some other things? Who knows those secrets? Some of you are telling the wrong people your secrets because you know they tickle your ear. I'm, I'm getting so much trouble. Dang it. James chapter 1, verse 18. I got to hurry. James 1, 18. He chose to give us birth by giving us his true word. That's salvation, right? He chose to give us birth, salvation, by giving us the true word. That's Jesus, right? And so here's, I'm giving the scriptures before the point because I know what you guys do. You fill in the point and you start checking out. Here's the scriptures first, and then I'll give you the point, okay? So it's like, James, why not are you talking about Jesus? Well, it seems like another change of thought, but it's not. He's showing us that, that you can't do this without him. You can't overcome that trial. Like, like, even though you know, I know, I know it's producing. Dude, in your own strength, you're nothing. I know the temptation is, is but, but, but I, I'm, I'm going to work it. I'm going to work it. No, no, no. But you can't, you can't defeat the devil alone. You need the authority of Jesus Christ, the, the word of, of, of your testimony and the, the blood on the cross. That's what you need. You, you can't do it alone. So you need, you need salvation. You need Jesus. And, and then he says, like, not only does, like, do we need Jesus, but this Jesus loves you. He's not mad. He loves you so much. It says, and we out of, and we out of all creation became his prized 
possessions like he of everything he created he loves you most he loves you most John chapter 14 and 15 gives us the last secret what, what he's teaching us uh, the last secret to overcoming temptation here's what I've noticed the more the more I love my wife the less I will the less I'm tempted even by other by other things the more that you will love your wife the less you'll be tempted by other women the and the opposite is true the less you love her the more that those things are going to look like they have something to offer the same is true with Jesus if I fall in love with him I'm not interested in what the world or the enemy has to offer John 14 and 15 he says if you love me you will obey what I command See, don't try to do the commands. Don't try to do right, be good, do what, check off all the boxes. Don't try to obey the command. Fall in love. And the commands are the byproduct. So let me say it this way, I'll close. Temptation is not really the test of your self-control. It's a test of your relationship with Jesus. That's why I encourage you today. Number four, fall in love with Jesus. Come on, write that down, and will you close your eyes and bow your heads all over this room, and let me just pray with you. Let's pray together. For some of you, this was a life-saving message today, a divine appointment today with every head bowed, every eye closed. Some of you are here today, and you're going through, you're going through the fire, the testing, the trial right now, and you're exhausted. And you're tired. God, I pray right now that you would give them the courage to pray, God, what are you teaching me? God, I pray that they would graduate, that you would develop character at Discovery throughout this series, that you would develop us, that you would build us, that you would grow us, God. For the person who's going through temptation, God, I thank you first that it's not too much that they can't handle and that you'll always provide a way of escape. God, help them today take the right steps out of it. For some of you today, you... Maybe you call yourself a Christian, but you're not really in love with Jesus. You need to fall in love today. Some of you have never given your life to Jesus. Like this may be the first time for some of you to like surrender the control of your life to Jesus. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna have you come to the front or single you out, but right where you're seated, I wanna pray for you. If you're here, and whether maybe you've done a religious thing for a long time, but you maybe even checking off the boxes, but you're, you, you, you don't really love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, whether it's the first time or you're doing it again today, I'd love to give you that opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So with every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, I'm going to count to three. I'm just going to have you raise your hand or online. Just type in, I need Jesus. Come on, if that's you and you're ready for a fresh start today, here it is. God's not mad at you. He wants you to approach the throne today to receive the grace and the mercy to help you in your time of need. Come on, one, two, three. Lift up that hand right now. I need Jesus. I need a fresh start today. I'm, I'm committing my life to him. Leave it up. Come on. Yes, 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 yes. All over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yeah all over here. Yeah. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Will you put your hands down and pray something like this with me? Come on, use your words. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, my past, my mistakes. Today, I give you my life. I surrender the control. I declare that you are my Lord and Savior, my God. Come live inside of me. Make me brand new. Take over. From this day forward, help me to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that. Amen. Amen.